I'm Father John Powers, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to our session today. Uh, if you're looking for a flashy entertainment program with a lot of singing and dancing and all sorts of superficial excitement, perhaps, this is not it. Uh, we're going to be talking for the next half hour uh, about a very serious and, and personal and intimate subject uh, about prayer. And our guest is Father Basil Pennington, a Trappist monk. Welcome, Basil. Thank you, John. I'm Good. delighted to... Uh, to have this time with you, mm -hmm. not just this one session, but two hours worth mm -hmm. of, of talk. Um, I know you, you're a very popular man in terms of uh, spiritual director, uh, writer, a uh, number of books. I know you're working on three books right now. Uh, you have your own religious community life, so to have you for an afternoon like this is, uh, is marvelous for me personally and also for our audience. Well, it's uh, good to be with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to talk about you're being a monk. Mm -hmm. And what some people might misunderstand about a Trappist. Mm -hmm. I know uh, some people may ha not have heard of even that word, Trappist. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Trappist is a popular nickname, actually, we picked up here in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, our community is very old. Uh, one here at Spencer, Mass, was actually found in France, the 12th century. Came over the time of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it was the community of Notre Dame de la Grande Trappe. So that's how the name Trappist came up oh, uh, as a nickname for that. And it, uh, the community went back to France, reestablished the order there, but some stayed here. And that particular expression of, this, of the Cistercian or the Benedictine life in its purely contemplative form uh, spread through France and then today throughout the entire world. Uh, we just had a meeting of our superiors 86 uh, abbots from really every part of the world, you know, from Java and mm -hmm. Yugoslavia and mm -hmm. Canada and uh, Ireland and, and Hong Kong and, you know, just all over the world, South America, Africa, Asia. And uh, Trappist is a, just a popular name for this particular expression of the Benedictine life lived in its a contemplative form. Mm -hmm. That is a, a life which lets, leaves aside the active apostolic ministry in order to minister to the church and to the world through the ministry of prayer. I don't know how many people would even know that there are monks alive and well today and thriving, actually. that this I think most people would think that, well, that's a style that went out years and years and years ago, hundreds of years ago. Uh, but you have many communities. Yes, as I said, there's about 86 communities of our particular branch of mm -hmm. the Cistercians, of men, and then we have about 50 monasteries of women. Mm -hmm. And besides that, there's another branch of Cistercians, and there's Benedictines, Camaldis, Carthusians. There's, there's lots of monks around right, this world. Right. And of course, that's just the Christian monks. Uh -huh. uh, you know, how monasticism is the very heart of Hinduism, Buddhism. Every great religious tradition has monks and nuns at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, people who are kind of trying to go to the heart of that spirituality and live it to the full as uh, you know, a real animating force. And also, you know, it, it's something much more personal than that. I mean, um, you don't become a monk uh, because you want to fulfill some of those social ecclesial roles. Somehow, it, well, you know, it's like uh, trying to explain why you fall in love and marry a particular woman. You know, uh, you can say it's just something happened and you saw a beauty there mm -hmm. that you wanted to, you know, commune with your entire life. And somehow God has gotten that across to us. That that this is the thing that really matters. Mm -hmm. And you want to give your whole being just being uh, with God and, and in God and for God. And, but what happens, of course, is when you fall in love with someone, everything that matters to them matters to you. Okay? And so when you have this uh, deep loving relationship with our Lord, you know, His whole salvific mission, His creative care of the world becomes yours. Mm -hmm. okay? And so then you are very concerned about the church and the world. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it's personal. When did you fall in love? Well, it was a growing thing. I would say I probably fell in love as early as, as when I was in the eighth grade and uh, began searching. Anything I saw around with diocesan priests, I was thinking mm -hmm. of diocesan priesthood. But somehow I knew that it wasn't big enough. And I began to look at religious orders and especially thought of the Fathers of St. Edmund, uh, Edmund down in Selma, Alabama. You never thought of the Passionists. Selma. No. Yes, I did. In fact, I made a number of retreats to the Passionist monasteries. And <laughs> little, I could, Cosmo little. Shaughnessy kept trying to convince me they were much more strict than the Trappists. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, 
In fact, it was uh, that insight that I wanted to be the entire world. And the only way you really can be to the entire world is through love and prayer. Mm -hmm. Other things you have to do in a particular place in different time. So. And that's kind of what, uh, what drew me into the, uh, uh, becoming a monk in the contemplative sense. You describe it as a growing, yeah, loving uh, relationship. Were yeah. there any significant aspects of that growth? Were there any, for example, significant people who helped you help well, that love nourish? The, uh, my first retreat at the monastery was, you know, uh, uh, what in fact, is that? Uh, St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Mass. Mm -hmm. And I, actually, I didn't know that week whether I was going to go on retreat to the Passionists in Jamaica <laughs> or the Capuchins up in uh, New York State or the, the Cistercians. And mm -hmm. the weather was great. Hitchhiking was easy. And I ended up in Massachusetts. <laughs> and just meeting that community uh -huh. and being immersed in that reality, then I knew this is, this is what my life meant. You knew. That sounds yeah. so... Uh, sitting here today, it sounds easy, almost yeah, easy to sure. say. At that time, yeah. You know, when you fall in love with somebody, you know. What else can you say? <laughs> you know. And that's it. You know, just knew that this was, this is where I found God, and, and I w would live with God, and and uh, and I must say, I I've never regretted it for a moment. It's what what aspects were attractive to the, in this love relationship? What did you see in this, this the woman that you found here? Well, it wasn't. It was the Lord, really. Mm -hmm. It was just that here was something where. You know, it was big enough. It, it, it just called forth everything that was in me. And it, it meant um, being in, involved in, in lifting up the entire world, to, uh, you know, to, to, to be to everyone. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, the Lord has answered that in ways that I never expected mm -hmm. through the different things he's had me do through the years. I expected to hold beans and pray for the world and do mm -hmm. little else. And, but as I always told people, you know, God gives you whatever you want. He doesn't always give it to the way you expect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so my way of being to the world has been somewhat special in many ways. But it has always been that of sharing our Lord's loving care for everyone and uh, you know, wanting to help everyone to find the joy that I have found in his love. You know, really, I, I, I bet it goes back to the first grade when I learned by rote that God made us to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to be happy with him. And a catechism that I had said to be happy with him in, in the next life, and, and I just agreed with that. I, uh -huh. I knew he wanted me to be happy with happy him with now. I don't think many people would remember that, that the, the catechism said that last sentence. Yeah, yeah. They would remember the others, but not, not yeah. necessarily remembering that last part about happiness. Yeah. Well, God, you know, that's all God made us is to share his happiness. And, uh, and, but he said, you know, unless you become as a child, you don't enter in. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, we, we're so busy trying to do it ourselves or do it right or earn it or something like that, that we get all mixed up. And, uh, you know, just, just entering in and, and enjoying him and letting him enjoy us. But this being for the world in the, mm -hmm. in the monastic community of the Trappist, uh, which is a cloistered life, it is a simple yeah. life, uh, I think most people would see it as, well, he wants to be for the world, but yet he's living in <laughs> a small world of one monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts, uh, with a little travel, perhaps, or a little movement mm -hmm. around. How can you be for the world when you're only in one spot and you pretty much stay there basically your whole life? I mean, you commit yourself to that mm -hmm. one community, that one place. Yeah, well, of course, as you, as you experience that and live it through, you think about it a lot and you see things happening. And, and obviously, these weren't in my mind when I came to the monastery, mm -hmm. but I see it now. Uh, the, f the first thing I see is that, you know, we are so one every single human being, we're one. And especially those who are baptized into Christ as a oneness. So that any time any one of us grows, any one of us you know, blossoms and comes more fully who we truly are, we're lifting up the whole body of Christ, mm -hmm. lifting up the whole humanity. See? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one element of it. Right. Another element is... Well, before you move on to the second element, yeah. maybe I can just share the, the experience of baptizing a baby. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I've always described, especially to my sisters who I baptize their sons and daughters, that somehow the church is getting bigger. I can yeah. almost, when you baptize a child, I can almost feel as a priest, somehow I'm getting bigger. I'm getting more strength or something, personally and spiritually. But just trying to describe, I'm not putting on weight, hopefully, but yeah. I, I'm, getting, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. getting larger. I'm yeah. That's, and, and, and we're so enriched by each beautiful person, you know, how, so like Mother Teresa, how she enriches the lives of all of us, you know, and uh, so uh, there's that element. Uh, another element is, 
I think all of us experience a tremendous um, frustration, in a sense, of seeing the way our world is going, the way our, our world is being destroyed and consumed, destroyed eco ecologically and, and even physically by wars all over the place, and uh, being consumed by the machines of war. And we see the great need of turning around to a peacetime economy. We need uh, our political leaders to begin to seek the well-being in the entire human family, uh, a, a real world government instead of this selfish nationalism, competition. And what can we do in the face of it, see? And, well, but we know that at every moment, this creation is coming forth from God. Huh? Like the carpenter made this chair. He took some wood and he made this chair and he put it on his four feet and walked away. And he didn't have to be concerned about it anymore because he used something to make it. But God doesn't make this world out of something. He brings to being by sharing his own goodness, his own beauty, his own reality. Therefore, he's constantly bringing it forth. And, and this is the wonder of it, see, God has decided that we can influence the way he's going to bring it forth. So he said, ask and you shall receive. See, he hears our prayer, our true prayer, the prayer of our heart, and he will be influenced the way he's going to bring this world forth uh, the next moment, the next hour, the next day, week, monkey, year, by the way we desire in prayer. Mm -hmm. So there is this power of intercession, this prayer, power of prayer. And this alone, I think, can change the minds and hearts of the economic leaders and the political leaders of the world. This is something we all can do. See? And this is something the monk can do, he spend, especially. He spend, he's free to spend hours in prayer, you know, bringing his longing before God you know, for this change in the world. See, this is an important element, I think, of our life. It seems almost contradictory to what most people think about uh, accomplishing something. In order mm -hmm. to accomplish something, you, you roll up your sleeves, you do the work to accomplish that mm -hmm. task. The work you're doing, to most people, seems to be not doing anything at all, mm -hmm. to be praying, mm -hmm. to be living in a religious community. But yet, you see it as the most powerful creative force. Yeah. I mean, uh, how else are you going to influence all the political and economic leaders of the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. Another element of the life is uh, one that's stressed a good bit in the Second Vatican Council and in the New Code of Canon Law, witness. See? The fact that men, now uh, take a spence, so we have about a hundred monks there. Mm -hmm. These men are all sort of backgrounds. Number of them were active religious before, Jesuits, Dominicans, and so on. Uh, number of them were doctors, lawyers, university professors, and some of them seamen, ordinary workers, fellows just out of school, but really fine people. Now, these men have given up all the potential, being fathers, having families, or the active apostolate, and so on, and they go there to give their lives to God. See? And that stands to witness that, you know, God is really worth our life. God has a first claim in our life. And it's like a, a billboard up the hill there saying, you know, and, and people see it. They, if they're thoughtful people at all, they're going to have to stop and say, well, you know, why? Why does you know, a doctor with a big uh, pr practice and so on suddenly leave that and go off into a monastery where he may take care of a few monks or something? You know? uh, why does a man who could be a very effective preacher and teacher go to a monastery you know, and spend hours in prayer? See? So it, it's saying you know, God is really worth that. God is number one, that the first commandment is to love the Lord our God with the whole mind, whole heart, whole soul strength. See? That's and I think a, most a, people, when they approach your monastery or any other, uh, monastic community, they sense that mystery that's there. They may not be able to oh, articulate yeah. what's there. They may not be able to understand uh, the language of, of mystical prayer or of, of that particular community, but they, they sense and have an intuitive grasp that there's something very important here mm -hmm. that should be held as very sacred and recognized. Yeah. It, just what you said brought up two other things that are involved there. I think one is, is it is a place where people can come apart. Every retreat, every monastery has a, a guest house, a retreat house, but just has space to where people can come for a few hours in the park or in the church or there and just sit and kind of abide in that peace. We try to create a climate of monastic prayer there. Uh, it just, it creates itself really by the fact that we are praying there constantly day in and day out and, and try to keep out of the area the things that would disturb that, radio and TV and uh, noises and, and things of that sort, activity and so on. Now there's another point I think most people would find difficult to understand is 
in a sense, depriving yourself of something like radio and TV, of going out uh, whenever you felt like it, of a car, of, of all the possessions which you do not have mm -hmm. and do not own, uh, that somehow this is restricting you rather than liberating you. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, ju you just take like radio and TV, for example. If you're constantly getting that plather hour after hour, hour you get so jaded, it doesn't make any impact. Mm -hmm. But if you just see the headlines, so to speak, get touched by the important elements. We had a beautiful old brother, Brother Patrick. He was, he was like the last brother from Ireland. And uh, as he got older, uh, the only thing he read each day were the headlines on the front page of the paper. Mm -hmm. And then for 24 hours, you pray over those headlines. And that was, uh, it called him forth, and that's uh -huh. what he prayed for. He couldn't read anything but the big print. Oh. <laughs> but that was enough. Uh -huh. It's enough. Uh, you know, you know the essential needs, and that really calls you forth. Instead of getting involved in all the details and, and so on, there's a freedom there, then, see? You're not a slave to hear all the latest details and all that sort of thing. But even just your, your use of the word freedom, yeah. I don't think most people see that as freedom. Yeah, freedom yeah. to most people is doing whatever I feel like doing when I feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, my women fancy or whatever, yeah. having enough money to do it, having enough uh, leisure to do it. Uh, whereas you're using the word freedom in a different way. Yeah, instead of being pulled around by your desires and your needs and so on, uh, by growing into a certain freedom from that, that you can really do what you want to do in life. Uh, you not have all these social pressures on you. You don't have all the uh, demands of work and competition and getting ahead. Uh, now, some of these are beautiful and growing demands of family. It, it really, you know, you're giving up some good things, but you're giving up further greater freedom to be to God and to be with God in a loving, creative response to the entire world. And you take a vow of poverty. Is this associated with this? Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Up? There are different <laughs> kinds, expressions of poverty in the church. You know, we're, we're all very familiar with the poverty of St. Francis, you mm -hmm. know, gave up everything and so on. The poverty of St. Benedict, uh, which is in the monastery, is more of the poverty which our Lord talks about of being, uh, you know, the child who knows his father's going to take care of everything. You know, uh, look at the lilies of the field, see how your father clothes them. Look at the sparrows, see how God feeds them. So you, you're free that you know the community is going to take care of all these things, and we do by our corporate work. It's real communism, you know, from each according to his means to each according to his need. Mm -hmm. And it really works. And therefore, it frees you from any kind of competition or any kind of uh, grabbing at things and so on. Your needs are going to be taken care of, and after that, you're free to do what you really want to do with your life. And But there's a, another kind of poverty that's deeper, that's more important. It's the spiritual poverty. It's the poverty that God's talking about when he speaks about being a little child. You know, knowing that of yourself you have nothing. It's all gift. Mm -hmm. God your Father, every moment is giving you the gift of life and strength and, and knowledge and, and all, all the gifts of your life. And you're receiving them as gifts. You know they're going to be there. And you use them joyfully. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to worry about them. And uh, out of that poverty, see, that, that uh, is, is really one of complete dependence comes richness because you have all of the divine energy, life, love at your disposal. Mm -hmm. This is the mystery of poverty that the church has to bring to people. You know, blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the kind of poverty that's talked about there. Mm -hmm. uh, abject poverty, no, no. Degrading poverty, no. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody should have enough in this world of ours. This is the way our Father intended it, and this is what we have to learn how to share, so they do. But having take, being taken care of, then we're free to live a fully human life. I'm trying to, again, yeah. what, would, what would people say to, to this? What would some people say to this? Yeah. It seems easy, the mm -hmm. way you're describing it. You're being taken care of financially. Uh, you've got a job. You've got a daily schedule. Um, don't have as many worries, family worries, the anxiety of competition. Um, how do you respond to those types of uh, what would be accusations for some people or that yeah. you run o you're running away from the real world where talented creative people like yourselves are needed to work for something i i think that uh, again another role of the uh, monastic community as community is to show people that this is the way we can live when we decide we're going to you know live together and work together 
and create a beautiful world together. And, and maybe it has to be done in small communities, and only that way a larger beautiful community will emerge. But this is the way the gospel, this is the way God who made this world planned things. And uh, you know, uh, off the coast of Greece is a, a monastic republic called Mount Athos. It's the oldest uh, existing republic in the world over a thousand years of continuous peaceful existence. The only ones who live there are monks, uh -huh. and the rule is the gospel. And there's just joy and peace there. And, and uh, again, it's a model, you know, and, and when you bring in families and things like this, there are many complicating factors. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it says, you know, that if, if we would decide to live for each other, you know, and would decide to live the Gospels, uh, then we could create these kind of communities. And of course, there are communities like this around the country, mm -hmm. the Hutterites and the Moravians, and, and uh, charismatic communities and so on, which are moving in this direction. We're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more people attracted to sure. this type of community living, uh, oh, especially yeah. younger yeah. people today who, who find it, uh, the peace of that lifestyle, uh, something very... The sanity attractive. of it. Uh -huh. you, <laughs> you mentioned poverty. We've talked about poverty, yeah. uh, non-competitive atmosphere. I, I've been thinking about the word power, that somehow this life has a power Mm -hmm. uh, that witnesses, you use the word witness, witnesses to people of something that can be. Yeah. Uh, but, and a power that's, that's uh, on a depth that most people don't uh, spend much time trying to delve into. Uh, well, you know, t just th take this beautiful surroundings we have here. Mm -hmm. it's you know, you could whiz by in your car and never even notice it. Mm -hmm. You can stop your car and sit and just let it come in. And the more time, the more you let it come in, the more it's going to call you forth and tell you of its beauty and call you into the divine beauty and get you in touch with your own beauty. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. People don't take time to stop and get in touch, you know, with what real life is, real beauty is, you know. Uh, this is the problem of a competitive, hustling world, you know. And uh, so much, so, this is another thing I want to say is, you know, uh, come apart, rest a while, look, see. Get in touch with your own beauty. Get in touch with the, the full meaning of your own life. See? How long have you been getting in touch with your own beauty at the uh, Spencer Monastery? I've been there since 51 when we started, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've been a priest in that community? Uh, yes, I was ordained there in 56, 57. Do you have a specific mm -hmm. role in the monastery? I mean, do you have a job description? In happily, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've had over the years different jobs, but uh, I'm just very happy to be one of the brothers. Uh -huh. Well, we and, have a, uh, we have a few more minutes in this session. session. We're going to have a number of other sessions sure, with right. you. But before we close this, I want to mention and show everyone some of your books. These are just a few of your books. And uh, I'd like you to describe them, if you could, as I, as I hold them up for our camera. I know they're not necessarily in the order of in which you wrote them, but uh, the first one is Centering Prayer. Yeah, Centering Prayer is a, a very a practical book, but at the same time, it's it also uh, a rich part of tradition. Centering Prayer is a modern name for an ancient form of prayer, simple meditation, which goes back to the fathers of the desert mm -hmm. in the uh, second century. And so it brings, it puts it in a historical context to show that this is part of our tradition. Then it very practically teaches that and puts it in the context of a whole life mm -hmm. and answers questions at the end and so on. Mm -hmm. It comes out of workshops, which I did uh, over a couple of years. Okay, and the second one, Daily We Touch Him. That actually came out before, and that come out, it comes out of the first workshops we did on Centering Prayer. But it, it uh, places it in the context of getting in touch with the revelation, which is the ground of our Christian life, which we share with our brothers in the J Jewish faith somewhat, uh, that God has really spoken to us, and we can respond, mm -hmm. and, and centering this, this kind of contemplative prayer as a way of touching Him and letting that open out our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Called. Called is a book on vocation ministry, what Christian vocation is. I, was a vocation father of our community for a few years, and that comes out of that experience. And it was written to help others in vocation ministry, but also to help any Christians really trying to understand what, what God's calling them to, what mm -hmm. their life is. And so it talks about Christian vocation in general, and then uh, specific elements within that, and how to discern it, and ways in which Christian vocation can be fostered. And, so. mm -hmm. and the last one we have, although they're not, not the last one you've written, A Place Apart. Yeah, A Place Apart 
it's kind of an overflow of the centering prayer. After we taught people this prayer, which is part of our life, they want to know about other elements. Mm -hmm. And so it goes through about 15 or 16 different, just little elements of life, things which perhaps you wouldn't think of so much as fitting in, in regular life, like obedience, uh, other things which obviously would labor, joy, friendship. Uh, and it, it talks about each one of those themselves, how we practice it, and then suggests practical ways in which the average person could bring that uh, element into their everyday life, mm -hmm. in home, family, and so on. Is this your primary ministry, uh, you're writing? I mean, you, you, you have a number of books coming in process yeah. right now. You have a number of them out. Do you find this as a way of your being able to witness and to... Uh, to share yourself with? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's, my primary ministry is being, being to God. And in that being, loving everyone and lifting them up in love. I think that's, that's my, my, the, being, uh, uh, the meaning of my life and, and the, the, the way God wants me with Christ to be to the salvation of the whole human family. Mm -hmm. And then prayer and praise and so on. Uh, but uh, the overflow of that is, is through teaching in the community and teaching guests and so on. And then through writing and through now, like this television this is, and others, this is a one way, way of, of lifting just, up. Yeah, it's it's a outpouring of uh, freely have you received, freely give. So <laughs> the Lord gives me these things, and I'm very happy I'm able to share them through the media. Uh -huh. uh, we're going to be talking about in our other sessions centering prayer specifically, okay. and we're going to be going into a lot of details about it actually about prayer itself. Uh, and I know a lot of the people who are viewing and listening uh, will have a lot of perhaps questions. I hope I can ask some of those questions that will clarify sure. some of these, these areas because I know prayer in the last has become very important in our community in the last Thanks 20 years in a yeah. special way. Uh, many mm -hmm. different names for different types of prayer forms and we think they're, they're new or, mm -hmm. or, or old or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I look forward to that opportunity of talking to you about prayer in our next session. Very good. I thank you very, very much, Basil. Thank you, John. Okay.